Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to now begin with our second presentation. Uh, SK talked about the sort of philosophical approach to the problem uh, or the uh, information about smart cities and smart parking. Now we're going to get down into the real world of what happens when you apply some of these uh, applica uh, applications and uh, programs to an actual city. So I give you Mike Sherwood and Brandy Stanley from the city of Las Vegas. Well, good morning, everybody. Feels like morning. I like to walk around. It doesn't look like it so silly, but I do like to walk. So um, Las Vegas is obviously a very dynamic city. Um, I've only been there two years, so I come from California. But just some basics on the city are up on the screen there. I think the most interesting part is if you look at the number of conventions per year. 21,000 conventions per year. So you can think about, just based on the last presentation, how does a city change? How does it handle inflows of people, especially in mobility and parking, which is a constant thing, which is why the city of Las Vegas started looking at what we call now a connected city versus a smart city. But how do we make our city more connected? How do we make flow of information and people more efficient? Or what I call create a user experience. But before we go into all those things, some of the highlights of some of the things that we're currently working on. So everything I'm going to talk to you today is actually production working in the city today at some level. So Las Vegas has the first autonomous vehicle in mixed flow traffic. Vehicle has no, basically has just a chauffeur. He doesn't drive the vehicle. He helps you get on and off the vehicle. That vehicle transverses a small um, actual downtown corridor where it drives autonomously taking people from one place to another. We're working on intelligent traffic signals. As a former law enforcement official, I know that none of you have ever been at an intersection at one o'clock in the morning with a red light, and then you look. No, no, no law enforcement's around, and then you buzz the red light, go through, because you want to get home quickly. So we're working on traffic signals that actually are aware of the vehicles in each of the oncoming lanes, and we'll go ahead and turn the light green automatically. We're also looking at signalized intersections that look at the amount of carbon munitions coming from a vehicle, and if it becomes too high, it goes ahead and turns the light green, not only for that intersection, but for four intersections down so that you dissipate any type of carbon or greenhouse gas buildup. We're working on smart lighting projects. We're also working on environmental. And then obviously, we have a large distributed sensor network, one of the largest now in the United States today, that's collecting all types of information constantly. But let's go back to the autonomous vehicle. It's a really great vehicle. Um, it's been working flawlessly, except for day one. In day one, in the first four hours, the autonomous vehicle was in an accident. Um, now, it was not the car's fault or the autonomous vehicle's fault. It was the fault of the driver. The interesting fact is, is that technology requires change and constant modification. The vehicle, people, the occupants in the vehicle, including the chauffeur that was there in the vehicle, saw the vehicle backing into the truck that you see delivery vehicle backing into the autonomous vehicle. There's one critical piece of hardware that was missing in the autonomous vehicle, a horn. People were yelling and screaming, no, the driver did not see it. There was no way to notify the driver of the pending impact, and that's kind of what overall caused, but that's the only time it's ever been in an accident um, since it's, it's been running now about eight, nine months, I think, somewhere in that range now, um, but actually working flawlessly downtown. So before we go into anything else, I'm going to give you, like my, I call it my safe harbor piece. And that what is that, since all of you were scared to death by the last presentation, so I'm going to give you a little bit of the little safety mechanisms here. But what does really IoT mean for the parking industry as you guys become more automated? What does it mean for connected cities? Well, there's, there's bad news and good news. We'll start with some of the bad news. The threats are expanding. There's more ways now to change your day from happy to your car has been taken over as you drive down the street and you don't pay the ransom, you're going to go off the cliff. So the threats are constantly expanding. The networks that drive all these systems are becoming more and more complex, meaning the amount of people required, the labor to manage and the education level is becoming harder to find. So there's a shortage of people that actually have the right skills to be able to make this work. In a government organization, you as a customer are going to have a very low tolerance for disruption. If you're used to getting up right now at 8 o'clock in the morning and going on your smartphone, um, I actually say good morning to my wife first, just so you know. 
Um, but if you go on your smartphone and you're reserving a parking spot remotely and you think it's there and you're driving to work and you get there and someone's in that spot because the system was down, your tolerance, the management level's tolerance at a city level, the customer tolerance level will become very low. So these are things we are guarding against already as we build out our connected city, which requires new approaches to security in general. There's not enough people to secure networks, to secure all the systems. So what we're looking at doing is we actually use a system today. Um, we use intelligent monitoring. So we consider it an offensive play versus a defensive play. All the data coming in and out of our network is monitored, and we look for patterns. We use autonomous and a, a basically autonomous responses. So how does this work, or what does it mean to you as a customer of a connected city? So really what it means is that in essence, if you're on a corporate network and you try to load iTunes, our system sees that you're trying to load iTunes and cuts the connection off. So we're able to look at data flowing in and out of the network. Um, we use the same, some of the casinos use the same technology we do. It was interesting, I can't tell you the name of the casino. I can tell you that a fish tank was hacked um, by somebody very young, um, and that fish tank was then on the corporate network and was able to get information from the casino and send it out. These type of automated systems, the same ones we're using, actually detect that information and turn off those connections automatically. Now, when you start talking about signalized intersections and other things, there, there's additional ramifications to that. But overall, we're using more artificial intelligence within our internal government within the city of Las Vegas to start defending and protecting these systems that basically run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, what you see that map there is, the, is one of the largest um, innovation districts in the United States. Um, it's broken up in several corridors, but basically all of our technology that we're testing that I'm going to show you today um, is actually live in a mixed environment, meaning people are interacting with that technology. We're collecting information as it flows through all of our systems. Um, as we say up here, though, basically the future of a connected city or smart city is constantly evolving and changing. Some of the things we did six months ago, we've already scrapped and are moving on to new projects, and we'll show you some of those as we go forward. But cybersecurity and defending the network is right now one of our number one priorities, where we put probably, I would say, about 20 to 30 percent of our resources out of our whole connected city effort into defending the network from breaches. And not just breaches, and it was mentioned in the last presentation, we're more worried about internal breaches, and when we say an internal breach, it's someone making a mistake. It's a human making a mistake saying, oh, go ahead and shut that system down when that system should be online. So how do we protect inside as well as outside? So as we go through that, I'm gonna turn it over to Brandy real quick to talk about some of the challenges that she looks at in the parking world, and then how we're taking that information and then moving it into our smart city sort format. Thank you, Michael. Um, this is actually sort of a recap of a slide that I had in a previous presentation, but basically what we're having a problem with is traffic congestion downtown, which I'm sure nobody in here has any idea what impact Uber and Lyft have had on our downtowns. Um, it's been pretty substantial in Las Vegas because we deal with 23 million visitors a year coming to the downtown. Uh, we have fixed street widths, we can't build out anymore, so we have to manage the congestion. How we do that is we have to rethink how we manage our curb. So right now we have a whole bunch of three minute loading zones, bus zone, taxi zone, all of that stuff. It's, it, 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 all the curb is parsed out. It doesn't make any sense and it's inefficient. So we need to change it. So one of the, these are a lot of the questions that we're asking ourselves about how we rethink our curb allocation. The solution is gonna come from the community. It's gonna come from the smart city community and it's gonna come from a lot of different directions. It's not one solution. So how do we maximize our curb allocation in key areas? How do we keep the traffic flowing? Of interest is, what options do we have in terms of regulations? We don't have very many options. So most of what we have to do is we have to, to go for voluntary compliance, especially on Uber and Lyft, and what technology is available or could be developed to help. So some of our solution is gonna be technology-based. And from a smart city perspective, oops, what we're looking at is we are looking at issuing a formal request for ideas to the smart city community. There are a huge number of brilliant minds out there that can really help us solve this problem. If it's digital signage, how do we electrify the curb? There's a lot of different ways that we think the smart city community can help us, and by issuing a call for ideas nationwide, we think that we can get back some really interesting solutions to the Uber and Lyft pro 
Uber and Lyft and traffic congestion. We don't know what they're gonna look like. I'm very excited to see what they are. So that was my token two slides. I'm gonna turn it back to the interesting guy. Thanks. So unbeknownst to Brandy, we're already, her own internal departments are already working on these solutions. So she's gonna to get to see them for the first time, some of them, as well as you, as far as what we're doing. So we talked about the Innovation District, downtown Las Vegas, Fremont, basically the Canopy area, downtown is where we have this living laboratory of things that we are testing. This is what it looks like again. Um, you can see it's not a perfect square politics come into play. Everybody had to get a piece of it, so it's kind of odd shaped um, in general. But it, it gives you a, a swath of different areas. So if we look on the southern part, that's our arts corridor. Um, the left looks like a key shape. That is our medical district. To the far right is mixed residential and business. The core, obviously, entertainment with the downtown Fremont Street experience area. Um, and then up into the northern hemisphere up there is more of a social economically challenged area that we're trying to work on and bring services abroad. One of the things I'm going to tell you is that everything we do in the city, if it's good for one, it's good for all. So it's total inclusion of all population. Nothing's excluded. The autonomous shuttle that you saw that rides and takes people around is at no cost right now. We're going to have robo-taxis this summer. They'll be at no cost. Um, most of the autonomous vehicles that we're putting in are at no cost. They're free to the community, free to um, tourism, um, free to anybody that comes in. So in our way of doing connected cities, we look to, at the bottom, we say using innovation to make life better. Um, that keeps the IT people like myself employed. But really the areas of focus are, are these areas up here. So social services, how do we use technology to solve homelessness? How do we use technology to improve medicine? Um, what if we could bring medical services to a facility so they didn't have to drive on our street, lower congestion? Um, those are the type of areas. How can technology increase economic development? And you're going to see some of those. Education, I think it's self-explanatory. How do we provide, there's direct correlation to children that have access to the internet versus children that do not have access to the internet. Um, public safety is always big. Um, mobility um, slash transportation. And then everybody talks about the digital divide, but I don't call it a divide. I don't want a divide. I want an inclusion. I want everybody to be included in this new connected community. And if Va Las Vegas can do these things, the other pieces will fall into place. If you can provide better education, you'll have better educated individuals within your region that you can pull from. Las Vegas had to go to California to grab me and bring me into the community. Um, and that was hard. I was in California the majority of my life. Um, so, and I missed the beach. But there's a lake. Um, but the bottom line is that these are the areas that the city focuses on as key areas for our connected. If you can bring these together and use technology, the city in itself will be better, the community will be better, and hopefully business will thrive and other types of opportunities will develop. So what does it mean to digitize a city? So it provides real-time insights. A lot of the systems we put in provides real-time information to the leaders or business individuals that need them. We're going to talk about predictive analytics, where we can actually predict a pothole before it, it actually forms in the street. And we'll show, we'll go over some of those things. This is my live laptop. Sorry, someone just came to work. It's, it's early in Vegas over there. So we have data-driven decisions. Decisions are made how different systems work based on the data that it receives. One of the things that we talked about earlier was a traffic signal that actually looks at the carbon emissions that come out of the vehicles as they're idling. It will actually change the light based on the data it receives. A lot of what we're trying to do is engage the citizen. So it's great to have all these sensors, it's great to have autonomous vehicles, but there's the little things. How do you engage the community? You can have all the greatest technology, but if you don't have engagement, if people don't want to use your service, then it's pointless. And then obviously my boss, the city manager, and all the other executives that I've seen to report to on a daily basis always talk about operational efficiency. How is giving a million dollars to IT, which they don't give me, but how is it giving you money to do this going to make the organization more efficient, more effective? How are these software systems or hardware systems going to improve life for everybody? So this is, again, the Innovation District downtown. And what you see are the little dots. And, and so just briefly, the blue dots represent our connected signals. So those signals are not only connected with um, temperature, air quality. Um, they also have the ability to use cameras. The signals are completely intelligent and work on their own. Um, most of you that drive around, whether you drive here or go back home, when you're at a red light, it's based on the timer. Just think of a timer, you turn it. Based on the time of day, they set the timers for different times. That's really how a signal works. It's worked that way for many, many years. 
these areas downtown, the signals actually talk to each other and they actually work together on their own and they make decisions just like you and I would make decisions. If you're parked at the, we'll just say the first one here on the far right side here, that blue one, the first which is Las Vegas Boulevard, if you're at that light and it knows that there's no other traffic at the other lights or traffic is low, it goes ahead and moves all the lights green once it changes. The first one goes from red to green. It tells the other signals, hey, I got four or five cars coming. Make all the lights green. If you have no cars, go ahead and let the flow go. And so it actually goes and allows, it changes all the lights automatically. If it starts seeing congestion midway through, it goes ahead and turns it red for the ones that are oncoming and then allows the other traffic to flow through. The intersections use LIDAR inside of them as well so we can detect people waiting at a crosswalk when the people are detected, there's more than one or two, we can make a decision based on how many cars versus people. We want people to be moved safely, so we can actually turn the light up, a couple of intersections up, so that there's no vehicles in the area so the pedestrian can cross safely. So those are kind of the things that, that we're experimenting with. That dark pink circle, that, that sort of the roadways that are dark pink, that's under construction now, we're about 50% through. That'll be the largest autonomous corridor in the United States, meaning any autonomous vehicle can go through any one of those pink streets and as it's driving down the street, our stoplights actually provide information to the vehicle itself. We tell the vehicle when the light is going to change from red to green. We provide other detailed information, um, basically GPS coordinates within roughly a foot. Um, and that's needed because if you think about your phone GPS, it could be off four or five feet. Well, if this is a vehicle lane here, if I'm off four or five feet and this is the oncoming lane, you're gonna be over here that would probably not be a good scenario to have. So on those quarters, we have extra GPS based capability that we're actually able to send the vehicles as they're flowing um, throughout that corridor. The plan is to test all of these things in a smaller scale and then long-term understand the budgeting and the aspects so that we can take them outside of the district and spread them across the entire community. So as we look at how we're digitizing our operations, these are the key areas we're looking at. Transportation, obviously water, for all of you, parking um, is one of the areas we looked at. Lighting, uh, waste management, environmental, public safety, and transportation, all those actual physical operations. How are we gonna change them? What are we gonna do? How does it work? Um, and basically looking at from mobile apps that interface to each of those issues, all the way over to um, digital fusion or command center um, apparatus. We already have that up and running now, so we're actually looking, we have a human that looks at all this data and then analyzes it based on a computer telling it what's the most important information that it needs to look at. Um, everything's basically built on two pieces, a strong infrastructure. Infrastructure doesn't have to be a fiber network, although most of what we run is on fiber. We also use wireless, uh, we use the internet, we use a bunch of different technologies for all the things that you're gonna see physically work. So this is a live demonstration. I always hate doing live demonstrations, but I'm gonna do one anyways. I'm a risk taker. This is Las Vegas right now, oh, maybe not. Hold on, try always an interesting, let's see if that works. There we go. All right, so this is Las Vegas right now. This is live. This is the only, this is a combination of several companies. I won't go over the companies that are, put this together. It's the only one in the world right now. So those of you that don't think your cars talk already, they do. Those red indicators up there are vehicles that are sending information to my sensor network and getting information. So what does that mean to you? Let's go down here to alerts. These are TCS, traction control system messages. That means a vehicle has lost its traction as it's driving on the street. So I'm actually collecting that information. Why is that important? Well, a pothole could be forming. So if you're losing traction, one of two, well, there's lots of things, but we'll make it simple. Either you have bald tires, I don't care about that. Well, I do, because it could cause an accident, so I won't say I don't care, but the other issue is that the gravel or the pavement, the asphalt is becoming loose. So I'm actually able to now start understanding what's happening in a roadway. But let's take it a step further than that. And this is all live data. This is physical data that is being, here we go. Somebody slammed their brakes on. Now, I would bet that they slammed their brakes on probably on the freeway because they were probably texting on their way to work. So what we can do is look at this and actually click on it. And it actually takes us to the area. It gives me the vehicle ID. Now, don't be afraid. I can't take this ID number and reverse engineer it. Um, I can't personally, the city can't personally, law enforcement probably could, actually they can. But it basically tells you the incident, 
what happened. And you can tell that, and this was on a rainy day in February, so I had to go back a little bit. Um, but you can see that the person, actually, the same vehicle, slammed on their brakes twice. Um, and the, the sensor picked up both, both instances of that. So think about the next step in this is the vehicles are already providing this information to us. We're providing information back to the vehicle. The next step, what we're working on right now is, for most of you, if you don't know already, if you're in a serious car accident, you have maybe five to ten minutes that you need to get help before it's too late to help you. So what we're trying to do now is it generally takes anywhere. So if I'm in a car accident, I'm going to lose. No one's going to basically call. If, if, I don't, if I can't call 911, I don't have OnStar, I have to depend on any one of you driving by to pull over, use your cell phone, and call 911 for me. Basically, that's how the system works today. You're relying on someone else to call emergency services for you. The longer it takes somebody to pull over or call on the side of the road or, or to report it in ways or whatever they're going to do to get to a 911 operator, that's time of your life that's expiring. So not only do we collect TCS and ABS, we also collect airbag information as well. So the next piece we're working on, which we're testing now, is that if an airbag is deployed in your vehicle, we not only know where you're at, because we have your GPS coordinates based on what your vehicle tells us. So think of the city as being the OnStar of the future. Not only do we know that the airbags deploy, we know how fast your car was going, we can decide based on the speed of your vehicle, the number of airbags that deployed, what kind of emergency services to send. We won't even bother calling a 911 dispatcher. A human won't be involved. The computer will actually talk to our dispatching system, decide on the rate of speed, and automatically go ahead and alert the fire department that's closest. So if you look up here, I can turn on the fire department. And now I have a fire station that just popped up right here. And so now the computer will automatically know, based on the vehicle speed, all the things we talked about, we'll know the closest vehicles to route to your accident. And by the time the vehicles get there, our cameras that are in the area will already point so that the operators that are in the dispatch center can actually physically see the accident scene, what's transpiring as emergency responders are on the way. So, and this is, like I said, this is live today. This is working. Um, again, if, obviously, we have hospitals as well. It's the same premise, um, as well as police. So we can turn all these on, and now the system, if there's no action, you see all the hospitals in green, potential accidents or potential vehicle issues in red, and then in blue is um, public safety or police um, facilities. But based on the type of vehicle errors we get, we can then dispatch the proper um, responders automatically. We don't have any vehicles right now that are driven by. Not all the vehicles that we have in the city or that people drive through um, report speed. But occasionally, if you have an Audi, we love Audis and BMWs. They actually have the technology that actually publicly puts out their speed. Um, and so we actually can collect that information in real time. Um, air quality, we have several, um, 27 air quality sensors downtown. We use them, obviously, for um, looking at the intersections. But we also use them for detections. If there's a fire, we can now detect where the plume's going to go of dust or any type of um, gas that might be. If we had a chlorine leak or whatever, we're able to use the sensors that we have now to decide how to route emergency responders or how to alert people that are in the area. And then the weather is important. Think of, again, all of this. I won't use the term big data. But we're collecting all of this information. And now we're able to predict in the future when it rains, how many accidents are going to happen and where are they likely to happen. So we can do one of two things. One, we can have emergency responders already in the area so that we cut down on the time that it takes to respond. Two, we can use the enforcement arm, which I love, put the police in the area. And then even if it's just a vehicle that's there, static with no person in it, and everybody, when they see a police vehicle, slows down. Hopefully that changes the way of the behavior of the individuals. But we're using this data and to predictively analyze what's happening in the city. And the same thing, when you see these traction control messages now, now we're able to start figuring out where the road has deficiencies, and then we're able to send crews out to go ahead and look at the road ahead of time before there becomes an issue. Sure. Answer. Answer. Completely separate systems? No. No, OnStar, you'll call, you see, OnStar is still, to me, old technology. Because when your airbags deploy on OnStar, they first go, hello, hello, are you OK? And I, I know this firsthand, but they actually will try to talk to you for several minutes before they call police and fire. They have to. I'm, I'm eliminating that part of the equation. 
your view, when you buy your, your nice new Audi or BMW, those systems are built internal to it. It's like your cell phone. You don't ask for Wi-Fi. It's in the phone. It's a convenience. It's a, it's, we talked about in the last presentation, customer demand. As a customer, you're demanding it. They're putting it in the vehicle. So you don't, in the future, I don't believe you're going to have a choice. It's going to be included because you're going to need this in order to move around the community. You do. You can turn it off. <laughs> no, I'm only a technologist. I don't. In, I don't. Uh, I don't do that part of it. That's up to the lawmakers and decision makers. I just provide the. Uh, the technology, and let me go back here. Obviously, my technology is not. There we go. All right. So you saw that part of it. So again, these are camera deployments we have downtown. Uh, these camera deployments you see on the far left basically do all types of things. You can see this heat map that we have. It actually shows the flow of traffic. Um, we know where cars idle, where there's congestion. Um, and this is all real-time data that we're actually collecting and using. The camera array on the far left does a variety of things. You can see the little intersection and the map pop up there. We're actually able to count the number of people that go through an intersection. We count the number of bicyclists that go through the intersection, number of semis, time of day, everything behind that. All that data is relevant to lots of things, and we'll go into what that does. We have a variety of sensors. This is one of our new street lights. Um, the street light actually provides free Wi-Fi um, to the community. It also provides a camera. The actual underbelly of the light, those are interchangeable modules. We could do two lights, we can do two cameras, um, we can do all types of different things. Every one of these lights has a PA system in it, built into it, has temperature sensor, has a variety of other sensors within the actual lamp head itself. So here's some of the applications that we use it for. Um, one of the things on a park trail, so think of a park trail, you can apply this to parking lots as well, but we'll go with the light trail is where we have it now tested. As you're walking at night, the lights, generally street lights, go to 100%. They're either on or off. What we're able to do is take the light down to 25% when no one's in the area. When the camera detects motion, we're actually able to turn the light up to 100%. So as you're walking, the lights go brighter. As you walk away, the lights go dimmer. And that basically saves a, a, a percentage of capital or money that we invest and actually able to return back to the city. Additionally, if a park is closed at night and you enter the park, we don't have to send a human at first. The camera detects motion automatically. The light turns from white to red and starts flashing. The PA system automatically puts out a message that says the park is closed, please vacate. If they refuse to leave or do not leave, we actually start taking video. We send that video to a cell phone or a laptop of the closest marshal. So now they have a complete situational awareness of the park itself. They know everything they need to know. They can talk to the individual that says marshals are responding. They can basically do whatever they want as far as two-way communication. Each one of these lights talk to each other, so the lights are able to, that's what the bottom antenna is at the bottom, the little black rod coming down. They're actually able to talk to each other, and we're able to do light shows and things, you know, all types of different, 16 million colors per light. We're able to do anything we want to do. The other things that we're doing with these lights and we're testing downtown is that we have a mobile phone app, um, but regardless of the phone app or not, if you dial 911, when, as soon as that signal comes into our dispatch center, we can get your Latin long. We actually change the lights and flash them red for uh, fire, blue for public, basically police. And that way, a first responder doesn't even need to get a radio call. If they start seeing a flashing light that's blue or red, they know that there's an emergency in that area, and they can start moving physically towards that area. Um, and then when we have concerts and things, we're able to change the lights to help people, the flow of traffic in and out of the city based on just light color. So that's kind of some of the sensor platforms we're using in different variety of ways. Here's, again, data. Um, you can see on the far left, those are into each line is an individual vehicle. If you look at the crosswalk pad there, somebody must have been late at night, um, drove over the crosswalk pad. Um, and that's so it's an outlier of information that we see. On the far right, we actually get counts of vehicles. Um, and we know total counts and all types of things. So basically how cities would figure out what kind of maintenance need to be done on a road is that, and I'm sure all of you have seen this, there's a person in a lawn chair with a clicker. And as cars go by, they click. And that was a, that's a job. That's a real job. Sit there, click. Car goes by, click. Um, I'd hope they wouldn't sneeze or something and miss a few. This system actually counts vehicles. Um, and I showed this to our city manager, and he was sort of frustrated. Most of the employees are supposed to be to work between 7 and 7.30. Well, they don't come in until 8. That dark 
green line, sort of the third one down, that's when the most vehicles come downtown to City Hall, is at that time frame right there. Um, and so it's just an interesting pattern. You can see, you can see other patterns during the day um, as well, and then you can see it taper off. But not only is this helpful for the city um, to have this information so we know how the road is used, take that now in the inverse and how you guys could use it or how others would use it, is think about if you're a Starbucks and you want to put something downtown. Now you know when to put your sign twirler out there or whenever, because based on the actual data, you know when most of your customers are going to be coming, driving by. So this now becomes an economic component. So that 3D map that you just saw with the different emergency components, we're actually going to be taking a flavor of that and taking that map and putting all of this general data on the map allowed for public consumption. Now the traffic, the, the vehicle information, no but this information would be available. So hopefully, if you're a developer, you're gonna to come to Las Vegas, you're gonna look, you're gonna see all this data and say, gee, that's a great idea for me to put my business here because there's foot traffic there. It's not based, they don't have to invest in a study or anything, the city's already providing that information to them. Additional matrices we do, so this is actually traffic analysis that we're able, and these things run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So we kind of see the flow of vehicles um, in the area um, we can count the number of bicyclists, we can do all types, we can see peaks and valleys of data um, at that intersection. Uh, you can see what we're recording, I mean we really don't get a facial recognition um, out of any of this data, it's all just static data that we're able to mine and collect and use to improve city services. It comes in many flavors, the data, this one here just gives a distribution of vehicles, vehicle type from bicyclist to truck, um, obviously cars are the highest rated or the, the most vehicles um, that we have, um, and then the distribution's broken out there. Um, we have these type, the, the data you're seeing right now, this is all real data um, from a couple, like six or seven months ago, but that we collect this 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so we're continuing to store and collect. So our availability of historic data to make business decisions becomes greater. This is distribution of people counting, so we can count the times what time of the day, how they move about the city. So now we know if our public transportation's working, if our bike share program's working, all types of different um, applications that we're able to use this for um, internally. Parking space utilization, this is a camera-based system. Um, basically does a distribution of how parking is, um, these spaces here are used. Um, obviously we didn't consult with Brandy, so that parking space one's not really a parking space, but we found something out. Someone's parking in it. So we have a space that's not a parking space, but someone's using it as a parking space. So that's data now that we would have never had as an organization. And so now we could use that for mitigation purposes or for other purposes to curb that behavior. Utilization, this is important. We talked about the person counting at the street level. So this gives us over time. We can tell you the number of total visitors that have been through that intersection. We can tell you the busiest days. Um, we can tell you the busiest hours of each day if we want to, or the busiest day of the week. Whatever flavor you want the information, however you need the information, we're able to determine and give you that information. So now all city departments can utilize this. We're also putting this out to companies like Waze, so they're able to take this data in and use it in their, in their basically their mapping and in their algorithms that show you the traffic speed and so forth within, the, within the, their application. So again, for us, we're not the best at making the best applications in the city. What we do, though, is we provide the data. We're hoping others will come and basically take it to the next level. So again, all these things is the customer experience, improved outcomes for everybody, improved safety, efficiency, and engagement for the customer. But for us, it doesn't stop there. So we talked about street and, and traffic and all types of things. We're basically built this ecosystem called Go Vegas. So it actually stands for Gov and then Vegas. But what we've done now is we've taken it farther from just a desktop and a mobile phone application. We actually stream out um, all of our services via Apple TV and Roku. You can download those channels now and you can get information about the city. You can watch council meetings. I'm sure all of you will love to do that. But the next step to that is, and we're going to be piloting this summer, is that you have grandkids or you have relatives that have kids in Las Vegas and they're going to play a sports game you're gonna be able to then get a key from the city, or as a parent, you'll get a key, um, a digital key. You'll give that key to the grandparents back in Boston. They'll go on to our Apple TV channel. They'll, pick, they'll put, type in their key, and they'll get to stream that first baseball game, that first soccer game to them, to their mobile phone device, to their Apple TV or Roku. We're coming out soon with Amazon Fire as well. 
So those are the type of services that you know, we're building into um, some of our products. Again, if you download our mobile Go Vegas app, we're providing free Wi-Fi all downtown. Um, now, part of that free Wi-Fi comes with some, some hitches to it. The application that you have that you approve when you read the license terms with our city allow us to collect information on you as you flow downtown, and the benefit you get for that is, is free wireless. We're doing a lot with conversational computing um, to the point where you can pay your bills via that methodology. Um, you can do a lot of different things with that. So engagements, number one, not everybody can afford a desktop computer or has a laptop computer. So we're looking at different conversational computing devices to be able to interact with those individuals. Um, it's my hope one day that you can reserve a parking spot or pay for things via this mechanism. Right now we're working on just sewer payments. So think about the government as right now when you want to do something, it's separate individual businesses. We have 21 departments within the city of Las Vegas. If you want to pay for recreation, it's one login for recreation. If you want to pay a parking ticket, it's another login. Just like Amazon, you're going to have one unified login that will work across all platforms, whether it be your Apple TV service, whether it be the actual engagement of using conversational computing, um, all of those platforms you'll be able to interact with. So what we have now with our conversational computing piece is basically you can ask it for a business license information. It'll provide it to you um, either verbally or with the new um, Amazon show. We'll show you the actual license. You can ask for a food grade. It will give you the food grade. We'll tell you what the grade of the restaurant is, um, all via just conversational talking to the actual device itself. Um, sewer payment, you'll get home in the future um, this summer. You'll sit down and you just say, what's my sewer bill? It'll tell you the amount. You want to pay it? Yes, go. We're also collecting information. If you constantly sign up for a yoga class, as we offer new yoga classes, then when you log in, or you, it'll actually tell you, here's all the great things. We might email you if you opt in. Everything's opt in, but it would opt in and provide it to you. Basically, we call it the Amazon service mechanism of, of providing that same level of service that everybody's already accustomed to. The biggest challenge we have is trust. Everybody trusts Facebook. Well, I don't know about now, but everybody did trust Facebook. Most people trust Instagram and all the different services. I mean, all of you, from a law enforcement perspective, I always am amazed. I'm out to dinner. They take a picture of their plate and telling everybody in their brother that they're not home. I'm out to dinner. Or I'm in Hawaii, everybody look it. But yet, I'm the government. I'm here to help you all, just so you know. But I'm here to provide you a service, not know if you're home or not. You don't want to talk to my Amazon. You won't pay your bill from it. Well, that's the government. They're going to know about my flush rate. We already know a lot of the information about how often you flush and how often you use water and how much you consume. Um, but it's that trust level that we have to build upon because we're not there yet as, as, a, as a society to fully engage in trust. We talked about the streaming content. So again, we're basically taking a lot of our services and streaming it. Again, this provides educational opportunities as well. Um, we can put these devices, they're, they're very low cost, into a community, into a home, and we're now able to screen, stream classroom material to the community, um, where if they don't have cable at all, but we provide them just internet, now they have resources for education. Again, building the community is important, because in order to run all these systems and networks, we're going to need qualified people in the future to do that. Um, and in Las Vegas, it's, it's, a changing diag it's a changing market. Valet parking, they used to, it's not as many valet parkers anymore as there were several years ago. Robo cabs are coming. The cab industry is getting smaller. Uber and that's disrupting that industry. Now in Las Vegas, I think there's six robotic bartenders. So there's over 20,000 bartenders today, physical human bartenders. And I'm going to give you the, the estimate is they roughly make 100,000 each. So that's a lot of money to be a bartender. What happens now when those bartenders, the robots replace, let's just say even 20% of that number, what are those individuals going to do? So again, it's about building educational service, reaching out to the community, um, and providing new avenues for the future. Because we're not going to need as many bartenders in the next 10 to 15 years, um, and I would say in the next 5 to 7 years, because the business will want to become more efficient, the robot is more efficient, and that's what we'll need. But we'll need bartender re robot repair people to fix those machines. So again, content streaming. Now this is where we get into what we're doing even, which is actually working today, but I'm going to give you a graphical representation of what it looks like. So one of the issues we have across the city is we want to keep clean streets. We want to have our parks clean. How do you do that today? You send a parks guy out every Monday. He walks around, empties the trash cans, and goes away. Clean streets. I drive my street sweeper every two weeks on X road. 
That's how all those services are figured out. The only way that changes, someone calls the city and complains, hey, the street's really dirty or the park is really dirty. So what we're doing is we're taking the investment we already have in the cameras, and you saw those, remember the street lights that we had earlier, and we've built something. Um, it's a child still, it's an infancy. Um, I can't do a live demo, so I'm gonna give you just a static demo of what it looks like. But what we do is we, the camera actually looks at the park, and those are my developers in the far left. Their trash that they have is in the far right. What we do is we analyze the video, we send it to a cognitive learning engine that we've actually built and developed. That engine started as a child, a kindergartner, it didn't know what dirty or clean meant. So we actually trained it by making the park dirty, telling the computer it was dirty, and now it's learning on its own what dirty and clean is. We're applying the same thing to the streets. So downtown Las Vegas, we're using the same cognitive learning technology to decide when a street is dirty and when it is clean. So now we're only sending street sweepers in the future um, when the actual street needs to be cleaned. We're only sending people to the park when the park is actually dirty. And we can, we have, at this park specifically, we have 20 cameras that do that work that are constantly looking at video in real time, 24 hours a day, and they're determining if it's dirty or clean. We're also detecting graffiti. We're also able to detect um, malicious acts, we'll call it, using, um, we don't call it closed circuit TV or surveillance, those are old terms. We use situational awareness now. That's the new word for we are watching you. Um, but what we're doing is we're analyzing the park. So what we're able to do is if we know you're a unscrupulous individual and you have your cell phone with you, all of our Wi-Fi access points and you have your Bluetooth on, we're able now to detect that Bluetooth ID is someone who's probably shouldn't be in the park. When they go to any city park and drive in with that Bluetooth ID, our cameras know that, and then we can detect the authorities and send them out to patrol the park or to keep an eye on that individual. The same thing as Cognitive Engine looks at trash in the same way. All the sensors talk to each other. And in the ground here on the grass, we actually have a sensor that tells the watering system and it tells the parks and maintenance crew when the grass is hungry. So again, fertilizing is always done on a basically once a month we go and we throw fertilizer out, we turn the water on. Now the water only comes on when the grass is thirsty. We only feed the grass when the grass is hungry. And so all these systems work in real time. This just gives you a, a, a demonstration of how it would, what the computer's seen. So this is actually the computer's thoughts. The computer's always asking, is the park dirty? It doesn't know. If it sees it, then it says yes, and then it actually generates a message and sends it to the proper park authorities. So that's kind of what we're doing right now um, in a small scale. We're going to be deploying it out to several parks, and we're going to be doing it on a route um, downtown so we can tell about the streets, basically looking at the gutters, looking at the trash cans. A lot of our trash cans downtown have sensors in them already as well. We can tell you if the trash can's full or not. That's not a big deal. But what we do more now is we look at the trash smells or not. So now we can tell you if the trash is smelly or not, and then we can change it out. So if even if it's not full, the trash can, we're able to know if it smells or not. Why is that important? When you come visit Las Vegas, we don't want you thinking about dirty, smelly trash cans. We want you thinking about spending your money so that Brandy and I can have a pension in the future and retire in the Bahamas. So we want you coming back. I mean, the whole goal is a customer experience. And that, these are all things that, again, residents pay taxes for parks and for public safety. They don't want to go to a park and have a bad experience. And so that's why this technology is helpful in that way. So there are lots of challenges um, with doing all the things I've just showed you, and there's lots of other things we've done. One of the biggest challenges we have is just internally. Um, it's breaking down the silos. Um, and I'm not good at that, because um, Brandy probably hasn't seen half the stuff I've just talked about. Um, so we, there's not a good communication mechanism internally. We're trying to change, we're working on changing that. Um, we're also trying to figure out what is an experience? What do you want as a community, as a resident, as a tourist? How do we create that experience? Um, we talk a lot about smart infrastructure. What does that mean? And how much is too smart? Are we doing things already that, that really some people perceive have no value today? Um, there are some. We've had some failures on certain things. Um, and then efficiency and automation itself. Um, what does that mean? Um, how do we take the person that's always picked up trash cans every day? I mean, they go intersect the, in, corner to corner, get out of the, whether the trash can's full or not, they get out, they look at it, oh, it's not full. They get back in and go, what do you do with that individual now that we've freed up half their day through automation and efficiency? Well, it's called job retraining. Maybe now that person can not only empty trash, but they could also paint over graffiti or do something else, but you have to train them in order to get them to do that. And then all the challenges that go with all this. 
We've changed some of the laws in Nevada for privacy um, concerns. We're still working. Next legislative session, I'll be back up there again to try to change some of the laws for basically protection of the citizen. Um, but there's a lot of challenges internally. Even maintaining these little small networks that we have, the amount of staff and resources, um, it's a challenge. It's a challenge to talk to political leaders that want to hire more fire and police versus investing in things that long term will pay off. Because we look at all of you, we'll decide where you live, and you already have decided where you live today based on a, a small set of rules. Generally, it's amenities. I lived in Orange County because it had great amenities. It had a beach, had a nice airport, it was safe. Those are the type of things people look for. So what I believe, um, and I have to say I believe, because it may, not, it may conflict with city council people, is that if you don't create amenities, these are the amenities of the future that people are gonna demand and expect. If you don't create that, then people won't come to your city. Growth won't be there. If you don't make, if we had different systems that no other city had or things that made things efficient and easy for the consumer, then they will come to us. Um, if we don't have those, there'll be alternative cities that do have that and they'll go there instead. So that's really kind of what we look at the business proposition of how we try to sell it internally. But there's a lot of challenges to what all that means and how do you support it and pay for it and maintain it going forward. So we came up with this fancy website. Um, it's not that fancy, but um, we try to put all of our projects out there. We try to share it all. So all the code, anything you've seen that I've talked about today, majority of it um, is out on our, on our website. It's called Innovate Vegas. We put all that out there um, constantly. Um, we try to update it every month. We also have an Amazon skill. If you download it on your Amazon Alexa, we do a, like a podcast every Monday going over what we're doing. A lot of that's just for community engagement. The more we can educate the population, the more we can educate our local community, the better it is for the community as a whole. So, but this, this website goes over all the things that we're doing. We have 400 now active IoT projects throughout the city. I just gave you some of the small, the, the larger ones, um, but there's a lot of smaller ones behind it as well. For those of you who have any questions, here's all my information. Sorry, Brandy, I didn't put you on there. But if you email me, you want Brandy, no problem. I'll pass it on to her. Um, but that kind of gives you an idea of what we're doing. Yes, sir. Okay, you've got cameras, sensors, sniffers, all kinds of things. Does this still mean that what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas? <laughs> it does. It does. We don't share it. No, actually, everything you've seen, just to make it make very clear to this group, there's nothing that's identifiable to an individual. It's all aggregated out before we release any data. So nothing ties back to a person, yet. That's right. <laughs> So no, we, well, we engagement, yes, we're working on engagement. Have we engaged with the community to ask what they want? Not yet, because we don't even know the technologies and how they work. So we're going to probably do our first survey um, sometime toward the latter part of this year. Um, we have not engaged the community. Right now we're looking more from a business challenge, what a city problems are and how we can correct it. What we don't want to do is give out expectations to the community that all these things are going to happen like in the next couple months or weeks. Some of them will be scared. I mean, when we showed the, the 3D map of the city and vehicles actually in real time alerting, some, there was a, a, a level of concern. People were worried about their cars. Well, how, I never knew my car did that. How do I turn it off? Do I get, can I get a Norton? I mean, that question, I've heard it before. I mean, People get very apprehensive when they see these technologies. I mean, even the ones that we thought were beneficial, which you're great, you could watch your grandson play his first baseball game, there's a lot of concern about that. So a lot of what we're doing before we engage the public is learning how to secure this information, how to secure the networks, which is why we're working with the state legislators on how to do that. And we're looking on how to share all this data with other governmental agencies. How do we do that? And how do we form a lot of what you've seen here is cost the taxpayer no money. Um, it's basically public-private partnerships. The companies that have put in all this technology, they did it at no cost. Um, one, because we're willing to take the risk of putting this technology downtown Las Vegas. Um, and so they're doing it at a no cost. They get the data and understanding of how their systems really work. And for a lot of these companies, who doesn't like going to Las Vegas? Um, so they put it there. We have that advantage where we put the technology there. Their consumer electronics show, so we get a lot of, uh, right now it's, I would say, I've only been in the city for two years. Everything you've seen has been done in the last year, this snippet, last year and a half. 
because I've not been there very long. So we've come a long way, and that's, that's what you see here is not a full-time team of people. It's myself and two other people that have built this out. So our community engagement will be next. Uh, how can we as partners today, because we do have a tool, John McCorn, we have a magazine, and I'm, um, I'm getting a common denominator of increasing awareness. How can we eliminate the fear, you mentioned fear, through providing the news about what you're doing? Through education. I mean, a lot through education, providing information. I mean, that's why we have our website. That's why I'm here today, more talking about it, letting the fear come out. <laughs> Let people talk about it and exchange information and ideas. So, that's fine. <laughs>